Following up one of our stories from September, the plot has thickened regarding India's assassination conspiracies. Viewers may remember that India decided to adapt a Bollywood script in Canada by killing a vocal critic of the Indian government, leading the two countries to start pointing fingers at one another. This new development, however, takes place outside of the land of maple syrup and is pretty fucking insane, so strap yourselves in for a wild ride. On November 29th, the US Department of Justice announced that an agent of the Indian government and other co-conspirators plotted to kill Sikh activist and attorney Gurpatwant Singh Panun on United States soil in New York City. This foiled assassination was announced to the public two and a half months following the murder of another Sikh political activist, Hardeep Singh Nijar, in Canada, whose death is believed by the Canadian government to have been orchestrated by India's government. An indictment released by the Southern District of New York laid out the details surrounding the thwarted assassination attempt painting a clearer image to the public. In the indictments, it was revealed that earlier this year, an unnamed Indian government employee, dubbed CC1, operated alongside others within India and abroad to attempt the assassination of Panun in New York City. Panun is one of the core figureheads of the Halistan movement and is the spokesperson of the Sikhs for Justice, a group who advocates for the creation of a proposed ethno-religious Sikh sovereign state away from India called Halistan. The assassination plan was orchestrated by CC1 and is surprising very close to the plan Palpatine had for killing Padme in Attack of the Clones. It is believed CC1, who was employed by the Indian government at the time, was asked to kill Panun. But he didn't want to do it himself, so he hires Nikhil Gupta to assist in coordinating the assassination. But Mr. Gupta doesn't want to kill Panun himself, so Mr. Gupta begins trying to hire a hitman for around 100,000 United States dollars. But Mr. Gupta couldn't find anyone to kill Panun, so he hired someone else to find someone else to kill Panun. Mr. Gupta eventually hires a reliable and trusted criminal associate of theirs to hire someone to kill Panun. But this other guy is also an undercover United States law enforcement officer and doesn't want to kill Panun himself. So the officer decides that rather than hiring an actual assassin to kill Panun, he'll hire another undercover law enforcement officer to go kill Panun. Truly brilliant levels of procrastination from everyone at work here. Gupta and his droid companion would go on to give the imposter assassin personal details of Panun's residency, show evidence of them stalking Panun's residency, allude to there being other Sikh targets for assassination, pay the imposter $15,000 in advance, instruct the murder not to take place during high-level diplomatic engagement, between the United States and India, showed evidence of their politically linked killing of Najjar in Canada, consistently beg over texts for Panun to be killed on a daily basis, and finally fail at all levels of discretion by doing these things in the direct presence of not one, but two undercover United States law enforcement officers. All because they didn't want to kill Panun themselves. Of course, Mr. Gupta was arrested after the officers got the information they needed and is being charged on the separate accounts of a murder-for-hire conspiracy and plain old murder-for-hire. At the time of writing, Nikhil Gupta is currently being held in jail in the Czech Republic with 
within Prague awaiting further prosecution on behalf of the United States. It is publicly unclear who the unnamed individuals are and what legal reprimands they will face going forward. However, United States FBI Director Christopher Wray has already made efforts to repair US-India relations and security cooperation after traveling to India on December 12th. While the greater public is left to theorize what actions are happening behind the scenes this very second, there is little ambiguity left surrounding some level of India's involvement against outspoken Sikh political leaders worldwide. India's government did not immediately respond to any of the information depicted in the US indictment, but they did speak publicly regarding the US security relations meeting, stating, the inputs shared from the US are a cause for concern for both countries. India takes such inputs seriously and has begun examinations by relevant departments. Panun and other Sikh supporters see these events as, quote, a blatant case for India's transnational terrorism, which further supports the demands for a Halistan referendum that Panun would, quote, be willing to pay the price of his own death for. We here at the Swag News team certainly look forward to seeing how the Indian government continues to adapt the Star Wars prequels in the real world, and are excited to see what plans they have in store to fully realize George Lucas's vision. The 28th United Nations Climate Change Conference, or COP28, was held in Dubai this month. A goofy sentence which would certainly set the tone for the event. At the start of December, the COP28 president, Sultan Al Jabba, would state in an interview that there is no science indicating that a phase-out of fossil fuels is needed to restrict global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The 1.5 figure, for those who might have forgotten, is the target set by the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015, which would mitigate a large portion of the negative effects of climate change. The Comments of Sultan Al Jabba were criticized by environmentalists the world over. Although he would later state that his words were misinterpreted, from what we could tell, although his English was very good, it doesn't seem to be his first language. However, the controversy would further highlight the credentials of Jabba himself, who out of all people in the world who could have been president of the conference, just happens to be the CEO of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. Sultan Al Jabba has been previously accused of greenwashing his reputation, and a Wikipedia editor came forward anonymously to state that they had previously been paid to edit his page to be more favorable. Dr. Mark Owen Jones of Hamad bin Khalifa University would also criticize Jabba, stating that the decision to install him as COP28 president was followed by a large multinational astroturfing campaign on social media sites. Dr. Jones would later state that this effort would involve 100 fake accounts and 30,000 tweets, which was designed to deflect criticisms of hosting a UN climate conference in a petrostate. Such criticism aside, however, the conference would be hot on the heels of the UN's Global Stocktake Report, a once-in-five-year progress update on whether the world is on track to meet its climate goals. The report was frankly boring as shit, so we'll just be giving everyone the abridged version. Firstly, it seems as if the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement has been enormously beneficial in terms of reducing climate change. Climate change. In 2011, it was predicted that the Earth would be an average of 3.7 to 4.8 degrees warmer by the end of the century, a figure which has dropped to 2.4 to 2.6. As a reminder, this is still far above the 2 degree oh shit threshold, and significantly higher than the 1.5 degree milestone, which would actually make our generation heroes if we managed to make it happen. As of September, the world is currently not on track to hit the 1.5 degree target, and to even have a 50% chance of pulling it off, global emissions will need to peak by 2025, literally next year. The report reiterated that the transition to a carbon-neutral world isn't going to be cheap, citing it will take trillions of dollars to even have a shot. The good news, however, is that solving literally the most expensive problem humanity has ever faced will seem unfathomably cheap compared to what it will cost if we don't. In terms of the COP conference itself, a big talking point that carried over from the previous year is a loss and damage fund. This is essentially a pool of money that richer countries can pay into to compensate poorer nations most impacted by climate change. Developing nations are inevitably going to feel the effects of climate change much more intensely, and the logic is that their suffering should be remedied by nations who are most responsible in causing such harsh conditions. This isn't even considering that some island nations are at risk of losing huge chunks of land to rising sea levels. Nations that even now are barely considered industrialized. The initial fund for such an initiative is laughably small compared to the damage, with one estimate putting current pledges as being less than one one-thousandth of the annual cost of climate-related harms for developing nations. If there's one thing for sure, COP28 really didn't give environmentalists much reason to be optimistic, and when historians look back at articles of the conference 100 years from now, they're probably going to think it was some kind of poorly written satire. Viewers who live in a low-lying region of the world and want to prepare for their new life abroad may be interested in today's sponsor. 
All right, everyone, this is the 47th time we've had Surfshark VPN on the channel, so we feel as if we don't even need to explain why it's so useful. But we're going to anyway. The easiest way to think about it is to look at Surfshark as your online wingman. While you're out there watching YouTube or researching why Shadowheart doesn't want to get with your goofy looking ass, Surfshark is hard at work fighting malware, trackers, and phishing attempts to keep you safe. Not only does Surfshark give you a cozy blanket of privacy while online, but users can also get around pesky region locks that might be in the way. The days of giving your family PC cyber chlamydia because you tried downloading a 360p version of Transformers is now over. Simply change your location to anywhere you like and enjoy an entire cornucopia of new media at your fingertips. If this really isn't convincing enough, Surfshark is extending their holiday deal into January, which means by using our code on screen, viewers can score up to six months for free. Surfshark is also so confident in its own product that if you decide to back out in the first 30 days, they'll straight up give you a full refund for any reason at all. Surfshark VPN. It's cheaper than the other ones. Meanwhile, a Colorado woman who spent 11 days on hold finally gets unemployment benefits. One in five young Americans thinks the Holocaust is a myth, and astronauts from the International Space Station find a missing tomato after eight months. In what might be one of the strangest stories we've covered, the director of the Miss Nicaragua pageant has been charged with plotting to overthrow the government. The strange accusations come after Nicaragua's own Shanelise Palacios won the Miss Universe competition, a victory of much pride among the nation. However, Miss Palacios would quickly become a point of contention within Nicaragua, when it was discovered that she participated in protests against the current president, Daniel Ortega. This led Vice President Rosario Murillo, who also happens to be President Ortega's wife, denouncing what she called, quote, evil terrorist commentators making a clumsy and insulting attempt to turn what should be a beautiful and well-deserved moment of pride into destructive coup mongering. Now, going after a symbol of national pride within Nicaragua might not have gone down too well. So instead, authorities directed their attention towards national pageant director Karen Celeberti. Miss Celeberti is accused of rigging contests to promote contestants with anti-government sentiments, and faces charges of quote, treason to the motherland. Viewers who have two brain cells to rub together may be one step ahead of us here, but these charges fall apart mighty quickly when you consider that Shanice Palacios won Miss Universe against 84 other countries. Not exactly a telltale mark of nepotism. Much more likely is that an insanely attractive woman from Nicaragua just happens to be against the insanely oppressive piece of shit who calls himself president. Just for added context, in the aforementioned protests against Daniel Ortega, hundreds of people were killed in the ensuing crackdown, which as you might imagine, doesn't inspire love for one's government. Quite unfortunately, Nicaragua has been cursed with absolute fuckwit leaders over the past hundred years. And this potato head looking motherfucker is no exception. Ortega came to power after overthrowing dictator Anastasio Somoza de Bale, whose family had ruled the country since 1937. Ortega himself originally sought to reform the country and was initially quite popular, winning 60% of the vote in the nation's first presidential election. Following CIA meddling, Daniel Ortega was defeated in the 1990 election, and he would unsuccessfully campaign for the top spot for the next 17 years. In 2007, Ortega would once again be elected president, and upon his win, he would immediately start consolidating power and removing all checks to his authority, effectively becoming a dictator. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become a potato-headed fuckwit. Nicaragua technically still has elections, but in 2021, Ortega won 75% of the vote, which is suspiciously high for someone who kills protesters, exiles opponents, and forces journalists into hiding. Carrying the national flag around can even get you arrested, because it's often seen as a symbol of resistance. The metaphors really do write themselves. Pageant director Karen Celeberti was detained along with her daughter upon returning to Nicaragua, seemingly being exiled from the country after being put on a flight to Mexico. It's not clear when Celeberti will be welcomed back within the country, but if Nicaragua maintains its tradition of being run by absolute stains upon humanity, it likely won't be anytime soon. The city of Hong Kong had its first district council elections this month, seeing a record low voter turnout of just 27.5%. This is significantly reduced from the last election cycle, which saw a record high of 71.2% during the protest movement of 2019. We expect a lot of long-time viewers to know the reason for such a significant drop, 
but for those who need a refresher, here's a fun lesson in history. Following the first Opium War, which is a fucking crazy way to start a sentence, China seceded the small region of Hong Kong to the British Empire. By 1898, the British were like, oh fuck, this island will be really fucking hard to defend if China wanted it back, which led to the two nations striking a compromise. China would agree not to attack the island, and in return, the British would give the island back after 99 years. Sure enough, in 1997, Hong Kong was returned to the People's Republic of China, with the condition that its people would return a level of autonomy for the next 50 years. This would be a fucking lie. By this time, British influence had become a huge part of Hong Kong culture, and the territory had become one of the most prosperous regions not only in Asia, but in the entire world. One of the biggest things that the British left behind was a respect for democracy, something that is not only non-existent within China, but is a system of government that the Chinese government actively wanted to abolish within the region. Fast forward to 2019, and a proposed bill that would allow Hong Kong citizens to be extradited to China would cause widespread protests across the nation. The Chinese court system has a conviction rate of over 99.9%, meaning for all intents and purposes, Chinese courts are basically cosmetic. It's these kinds of laws that would scare the absolute shit out of Hong Kong citizens and lead to a protest movement that would last for over a year and result in more than 10,000 arrests and at least 15 confirmed deaths. We've obviously covered an absolute metric shit ton of the protests on the channel, but Swag cannot stress enough just how much better the Hong Kong protesters are when compared to the rest of the world. These guys formed a 28 mile long human chain. They would all dress in black to remain impossible to distinguish, and they would use umbrellas to fight pepper spray and riot hoses. They would even have teams of people who could disarm tear gases as they were fired, which would operate like a fucking pit stop crew. Swag was lucky enough to talk to one of the protesters at the time and the logistics side alone was fucking bonkers. The protester described how their communication systems were so good that they could stage a protest and often be able to track police so well that there would be no evidence of them ever being there by the time they arrived. Needless to say, these guys were on another level. Unfortunately, however, their efforts were severely stifled by a combination of more severe laws as well as the COVID-19 pandemic, which snuffed out any notion of in-person protests. Fast forward back to today, and the low voter turnout can mostly be attributed to the laws of who is able to run for election, with China ruling that only patriots should be allowed to administer the city. On top of this, the proportion of seats given to elected officials is only around 20%, meaning even if 100% of the city voted for something, it wouldn't matter if the Chinese government decided that they didn't want it to happen. As it turns out, people who have lived under a stable and thriving democracy get really pissed off when it's taken away, and the numbers are starting to speak for themselves. As of October this year, a survey conducted by a global recruitment firm found that over half of Hong Kong's professionals have already made plans to leave the city within the next five years. This isn't just talk either, as 96% of those have already taken steps to prepare for work abroad. According to some sources, as many as half a million people have already left Hong Kong, which leaves officials within the city fearing for a serious brain drain that may soon take hold. Among one of the most popular immigration destinations is the UK itself, who in 2020 opened itself up to 3 million Hong Kong citizens to migrate into the country and apply for citizenship. This is partly because the UK feels bad for essentially leaving their fellow Commonwealth citizens to the wolves, but also because most of the immigrants are extremely educated millennial workers. The UK essentially just gets a highly skilled workforce it never had to bother to educate, who are at prime taxpaying age and already like British shit anyway. Within Hong Kong, however, it seems as if its national identity may be coming to an end. The Chinese government has already prioritized Mandarin in its education systems, restricted press freedom, made it an offense to insult the Chinese national anthem, and started migrating mainlanders into the region in an attempt to assimilate the local culture. Hong Kong has slid a long way from its democracy values in only a short five years, and at this stage, those within the region will either have to commit to leaving or getting comfortable under a more restrictive Chinese rule. 
Viewers may recall our coverage of the nation of Argentina and their presidential election from last month. The winner of the election and funny thumbnail guy Javier Malay has brought a great deal of attention to the South American nation over the past month, not only from his larger-than-life personality, but from his grand vision for the country. Malay's platform has been particularly divisive within the nation of Argentina, with some calling it radical and even reckless, while others claim that desperate times really do call for desperate measures. We will begin by reiterating some details about his campaign promises and policy positions. As a self-proclaimed anarcho-capitalist, Mr. Malay ran on cutting all public government spending by 15% and opposes virtually all forms of social safety nets and welfare programs. In addition to general cuts to overall public spending, Malay also advocated for the dissolution of the National Bank and switching their national currency from the Argentinian peso to the US dollar. In terms of social issues, Malay is certainly a sledgehammer over scalpel kind of guy, previously advocating for banning sex education from public schools, banning abortion, pledging to pull Argentina out of the Paris Climate Agreement and has even made personal attacks on Pope Francis, calling him, quote, a piece of shit and a fucking communist. President Malay, living up to his reputation, has also advocated for looser firearm restrictions and dabbled with the idea of a marketplace for human organs. But I don't think that ever made it past the brainstorming phase. In Malay's inaugural address, attended among many by Vladimir Zelensky, he would state, quote, There is no alternative for a shock adjustment. There is no money. We know that in the short term, the situation will worsen, but we will soon see the fruits of our effort, having created the base for solid and sustainable growth. After officially taking office, Mr. Malay took to social media to announce he had signed a bill that would cut the number of government ministries in half, from 18 to 9. The ministries dissolved by this bill include the Ministry of Culture, Health, Labor, Social Development, Women, Gender and Diversity, and the Ministry of Education, or the Ministry of Indoctrination, according to Mr. Malay. These six will be absorbed by a single new body, which will be known as the Ministry of Health and Human Capital. The news articles we found differed on whether this will be separate from the Ministry of Health, so maybe local Argentinians can let us know in the comments. Other ministries include the Ministry of Public Works, Transport, Energy and Mining, and the Ministry of Telecommunications. These four will also be consolidated into a single body that will be known as the Ministry of Infrastructure. Along with the restructuring, Malay has also rolled back workers' rights, ended limits on exports, devalued the country's currency by 50%, and suspended all public works. As you might imagine, not everyone within the country has been on board with President Malay's shock therapy style of economic management, with protesters comparing him to a dictator or Roman emperor. Supporters, on the other hand, more or less said the Spanish equivalent of let him cook, stating that his background as an economics professor probably means that he has some kind of plan. A lot of President Malay's proposals will need the approval of Congress to be fully realized, so we might not see his entire wish list for the country come into practice. In any case, only time will tell whether the libertarian Dr. Octopus will save the country from economic ruin or push it further into the void. We now turn to our favorite lesser known country that rarely makes the news, the United States of America. On the 19th of this month, the Colorado Supreme Court ruled 4-3 that former President Donald Trump could not appear on the state's primary election ballot. The case, Anderson v. Griswold, was filed by a group of Republican and independent voters to remove Trump from the Colorado primary ballot, with the voters claiming that then-President Trump incited an insurrection on January 6, 2021, violating Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, barring him from holding the office of President. As Colorado also has a law on the books that prevents ineligible candidates candidates from appearing on the ballot, the voters claim that Trump should be removed from the state's ballot as a result. To understand the controversy a bit better, we're going to go over 213 pages of a court ruling in 213 seconds or less. To begin, the case was first ruled in a Colorado district court, who ruled that Trump was in fact still eligible to run despite also ruling that he was an insurrectionist. The case was appealed, however, with the state Supreme Court overturning the ruling and declaring Trump ineligible. Not including procedural work, there are five main questions the court considered when making their decision. First, does Section 3 of the 14th Amendment apply to the President of the United States? States. To save some time, Section 3 essentially says that an elected official cannot engage in an insurrection or rebellion against the state, or give aid or comfort to the state's enemies. This rule can be overturned with the support of two-thirds of Congress, but we'd probably have an easier time getting a Titanfall 3 than that happening. For further context, the state Supreme Court ruled that the presidency is an office based on wording in the Constitution. Finally, the presidential inauguration oath required by the Constitution includes a section where the president promises to preserve, protect, 
protect and defend the Constitution. Thus, Section 3 of Amendment 14 does apply to the presidency in the eyes of the court. Second, is the information from the January 6 committee report hearsay or acceptable evidence? In federal and Colorado law, hearsay is usually not acceptable, with an exception for trustworthy reports commissioned by a public office for the purpose of fact-finding. Both the court and Trump's legal team agreed that the report was intended to find facts, so only the trustworthiness was considered. Trump's team argued that because the report was biased as a result of the political affiliation of the investigators, it is inherently untrustworthy, and while the report itself is not hearsay, there are some parts that might be. The court disagreed with both of these points, since the report had investigators from both parties and evidence coming from mostly Trump's staff. The level of bias was acceptable. The court also noted that they would only consider parts of the January 6 report that were directly submitted as evidence, and ignore parts that were not, meaning that the parts of the January 6 report submitted were acceptable evidence. Third and fourth, do the events at the Capitol on January 6 count as an insurrection? And did President Trump engage in insurrection? In order for Trump to be an eligible under the 14th Amendment, he must have engaged in insurrection or rebellion. The court noted that an insurrection is more serious than a riot, and to be considered an insurrection, one must attempt to forcefully change or remove the government or modern political society with no requirement based on duration or location. The court also noted that in prior cases regarding insurrection, encouraging or helping an insurrection counts as engaging with one. The court determined that the January 6 events progressed past an ordinary riot when the mob broke into the Capitol building building and attempted to kill elected officials and prevent certification of the 2020 election, a normal government process. The court determined that in addition to previous tweets about the 2020 election, Trump's speech on January 6th, where he reiterated calls to stop the certification of votes, only further encouraged and agitated his supporters. During the invasion, Trump refused to call back the mob, at one point stating that perhaps Mike Pence deserved to be hanged, that other officials deserved the mob, and failing to attempt to stop it until after the insurrection had been suppressed. Thus, the events of January 6 were an insurrection, and President Trump engaged in insurrection by inciting and encouraging the insurrectionists. Finally, was Trump's speech on January 6 protected by the First Amendment? Trump argued that his speech was protected by the First Amendment, and therefore cannot be used as evidence against him, but as you could guess, both the district and state court disagreed. It has been established for decades that the right to free speech does not cover actual threats and calls to lawless action, with a few cases establishing the Brandenburg test to determine if speech is protected. For example, speech is not protected if the speech is directed to incite or produce imminent lawless action, and the speech is likely to incite or produce such an action. The court found that many of the same tweets and speeches made by Trump that showed he engaged in the insurrection also counted as encouraging violence and rioting, actions which are obviously lawless. As established previously, Trump's actions were a direct incitement to the rioting, meaning that they were likely to incite lawlessness. Thus, Trump's speech on January 6th fails the Brandenburg test and is not protected by the First Amendment. The full text of the decision will be linked in the sources below for viewers to read through if they would like. The ruling was 4-3, to three, with two of the dissenting judges ruling that Trump requires a conviction to be barred from running, even if not specifically mentioned in the 14th Amendment, instead of simply being ruled to be an insurrectionist, with the third dissenter saying that Colorado courts did not have the authority to rule on the case. Reactions between the parties were about what you'd expect outside of a few like Republican Chris Christie, saying he believes Trump was an insurrectionist, but that he should not be removed until he is convicted. Otherwise, it's as you expect. Republicans oppose the ruling, calling it an attack on democracy, while Democrats say that it's proof that actions have consequences. The ruling has kick-started efforts in other states to remove Trump from the local ballot as well. The Colorado court's ruling has been paused until the 4th of January, to give Trump's team time to appeal to the Supreme Court, who would then rule on the decision. The three most likely grounds for the appeal are the lack of due process for the insurrectionist status, the claim that the 14th Amendment does not apply to the president, and that the First Amendment protects Trump's January 6th speech. If Trump for some reason decides not to appeal, or the court rejects the appeal, Trump would be removed from Colorado ballots. If the Supreme Court agrees to hear the appeal, Trump will be put back on the ballot until the Supreme Court makes its decision. Also, the appeal would pause lawsuits in previously mentioned states until the Supreme Court case is decided.
decided, placing a time crunch on many states to make a final decision on Trump's eligibility. By law, ballots must be finalized and sent to military bases overseas 45 days before the election, which for South Carolina is on the 10th of January. As it is more certain than me downranking in Overwatch that this is going to the Supreme Court and will be in the news in the future, viewers can expect coverage in the coming months as yet another legal shit show wraps up. The war between Israel and Hamas has continued as usual over December, as the conflict creeps closer to its third month. The temporary truce to exchange hostages ended on the 1st of December, with both Israel and Hamas blaming the other side for failing to agree upon an extension. Speaking after the truce ended, a Hamas official stated that the only hostages still held by his organization were, quote, soldiers and civilian men who served in the occupation army. Most of the previous prisoners traded in November's exchange were women and children, as it seems neither side was very enthusiastic about releasing fighting-age males from their custody. Although Hamas had previously agreed to allow the Red Cross to check up on these remaining prisoners during the truce, such access was never granted. On the side of Israel, although it's been fronting a successful military campaign, its international partners have expressed concerns over its incursion into Gaza. Inventor of the chair and current US President Joe Biden would comment on the matter with, quote, Israel Israel's security can rest on the United States, but right now it has more than the United States. It has the European Union, it has Europe, it has most of the world, but they're starting to lose that support by the indiscriminate bombings that take place. For context, according to self-reported figures from Gaza officials, more civilians have been killed in the last three months within Gaza than civilians within Ukraine since the start of the Russian invasion. Viewers should keep in mind that Hamas is the de facto ruling government in Gaza. Critics have speculated that there may be an incentive to inflate these figures. Alternatively, more concrete figures are the amount of people killed trying to report on the conflict. Although the war has only been going since October, more journalists have died trying to cover it than the whole of the Vietnam War. President Biden has been very careful to toe a fine line when it comes to support within the region, so far backing Israel's incursion into Gaza. At the same time, Biden would state that Israel, quote, can't say no to a Palestinian state. Officially, the United States does not recognize the state of Palestine, but rather recognizes the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, as the legitimate representative entity for the Palestinian people. International relations don't make much sense to us either. In a resolution passed by the United Nations this month, 153 out of 193 member countries called for a ceasefire within Gaza. 23 abstained, and 10 countries including the US and Israel were against the measure, meaning the United States didn't have the support of some of its closest allies, such as Canada, Australia, and Japan. Israel and the United States argue that a ceasefire within Gaza would only strengthen the position of Hamas, and that Palestinians should have a right to live without its influence. Supporters, on the other hand, cite the obvious humanitarian crisis within Gaza, including the insane level of civilian casualties since the start of the conflict. The vote ultimately doesn't mean all that much in terms of actual consequence, but it's nevertheless a clear demonstration that Israel is on thin ice on the world stage. Viewers might remember that in our October episode, we were able to talk to two key witnesses in the area. The first was a lifelong resident of Gaza, someone we only knew as Sammy, but quite unfortunately, he was killed in an airstrike in the middle of October. The second, however, is a member of an IDF tank crew, 23-year-old Corporal Daniel. Daniel himself went dark for the majority of November after being sent into Gaza. But from the brief contact we had with him this month while on leave, he was able to tell us snippets of his experience on the ground. When asked how he was feeling after nearly a month of radio silence, he had this to say. Me? I'm fine. It wasn't a pleasant experience. We lost people. Some close friends. We didn't get hit. Our trophy system intercepted several charges. But our lead tank was hit and it was very scary. No one in it was hurt, but still. Don't know how long our luck will hold out. Overall though, we're staying optimistic. Morale is extremely high. We're going to see this through to the end, no matter how long it takes. When asked about his opinion on the international reaction to Israel's incursion into Gaza, Daniel admitted that neither he or many of his comrades have had the opportunity to tune into the news, and even admitted that he hadn't seen our October news episode, one where he was heavily featured. In his view, it isn't his job to be a representative on the international stage, instead leaving politics to the experts. Although he admits that Israel is far from perfect, Daniel still affirms that his side is the good guy, although he puts this phrase in quotes. At one point when we talked to Daniel about Israeli settlement and the nation's perception on the world stage, he once again went dark. After around half a week, he would apologize as he had been busy fighting in the Shuja'iya neighborhood, describing the experience as, quote, 
fucking rough. He would then go on to say, Anyway, yeah, settlements suck, I already told you my opinion of them. But still, we have no governing power over Palestinian territories. But in the end, like always, it all boils down to the fact that people have no idea what's going on here. People think they know, but they really truly don't. But eh, again, speaking to a wall. There was a lot of other information Daniel was able to share over the month. So in the interest of time, we'll just compile the most interesting points. From his experience, Hamas fighters within Gaza have been surrendering at a much higher rate than usual this month, and Daniel himself believes that this is likely due to a disconnect between the fighters on the ground and its leadership abroad. When asked about how many of those surrendering are actually militants, Daniel would estimate that around 40% of those captured are determined to be civilians and then transferred to refugee zones. One interesting off-handed comment he made was how he overheard some COs talk about the current timeline. From what they were saying, the United States suggested they wrap up the operation by the end of January. In terms of actual reporting, this isn't exactly solid information, but it shows that there's a lot of international pressure for Israel to end its incursion. Purely on a personal level, it's been interesting to talk to Daniel over the last two and a half months, because we've been able to see a person become hardened by war in real time. Daniel went from a green tanker only a few months ago to having friends die, experience a real sense of fear in the heat of combat, and face that he's in a war that isn't supported by most of the international community. He also mentioned that he's been given a single day of leave in the month of January to attend his father's memorial, someone who was also a tanker in the Israeli Defense Force. As a team, we understand that sharing the opinions of an IDF tanker without another perspective from within Gaza might have the capacity to somewhat skew our reporting. However, internet service is nearly non-existent within Gaza, and as mentioned, our last contact unfortunately died. There's a case to be made that not being able to find a contact says more about the situation on the ground than any one person ever could. Around two years ago, we were actually able to get a quote from a member of Hamas when tensions briefly flared up within the region. But because we actually had to appeal for that video to stay up, we don't want to mention that quote here. Viewers interested, however, can watch that video separately, which goes way more into depth about the context of the current war. As always, here are the final self-reported casualties of the current war as of the end of the month. For everyone's sake, we hope they don't climb too much higher. Our next story brings us to Ukraine, where Russia is undergoing the 22nd month of its invasion. One of the biggest headlines from the war this month comes from the European Union, where the EU Parliament is contemplating granting Ukraine another 300 billion USD. The best part of the decision from the perspective of Ukraine is that all of this money comes from seized Russian assets since the start of the war. As you may expect, this move has angered the Kremlin, with Russia announcing that they have compiled a list of 30 companies that they would nationalize, should the decision go through. Nationalization means that the Russia state would simply seize the assets of a company within its borders, and the business involved would have no recourse in terms of getting their shops, factories, or other assets back. Nationalizing companies is an excellent way to secure free assets quickly for a state like Russia, and this is a nice bonus when their economy is trying to prop up a useless and costly war. The downside, however, is that nationalizing even once can scare the absolute shit out of foreign investors, as if being the most sanctioned country in the world wasn't bad enough. Like the entire war, Russia continues to trade long-term prosperity, all for the chance to get absolutely decimated by weapons the United States is trying to clear out of its stockpiles. The other main headline coming from Ukraine is the arrest of Ukrainian opposition leader and pro-Putin politician Viktor Medvedchuk. Before Russia's invasion in February 2022, Mr. Medvedchuk was under house arrest and being investigated for treason. Following the invasion, Mr. Medvedchuk allegedly escaped detainment and has been on the run ever since. President Zelensky took to social media, stating that the pro-Russian politician has since been arrested. He is accused of providing Russian officials with advanced knowledge of Ukrainian strategies, as well as assisting Russian operators in Ukraine. Mr. Medvedchuk and his lawyers have denied any wrongdoing, and any sort of trial will have to wait, so these claims have not been verified as of time of writing. In other news regarding the war, it seems as if Ukraine has broken a very coveted military record. According to a team of Ukrainian snipers, they recently earned the record for the longest kill shot ever attempted. The team claims they were able to eliminate a Russian officer from a distance of 12,470 feet, around 2.4 freedom miles or 3.8 kilometers. It is estimated that the bullet had a travel time of around 9 seconds, which is roughly long enough to beat the campaign of 2023's Modern Warfare 3. The sniper, a 58-year-old man by the name of Vyacheslav Kovalsky, 
recently revealed details in an interview with the Wall Street Journal. According to Kowalski, he and his spotter were both competitive shooters before the outbreak of the war, meaning even before the invasion, they were doing this shit for fun. According to the interview, Vyacheslav Kowalski was hesitant to pull the trigger for his record-breaking shot, believing the distance to be unrealistic. However, the spotter disagreed with him, telling him, yeah, nah, just fucking send it. According to an interviewed US Marine, shots between 600 and 1,000 meters are second nature to a trained sniper. The laser spotters and rifle are able to appropriately gauge wind, air pressure, and many other factors that go into the accuracy of a sniper round. However, once the range extends past that mark, the laser spotter and rifle scope become much less reliable as the distance grows. The previous record, set by an anonymous Canadian JTF-2, represented here as the operator Buck from the hit tactical shooter game Rainbow Six Siege, has stood since 2017. This impressive shot was around 3,540 meters and was fired by a McKillen TAC-45 anti-material rifle with a 50 BMG armor-piercing round. Many critics have doubted the shot, as the ammunition used wasn't a human-piercing round and was only capable of shooting through lightly armored vehicles. The new record was set with the Ukrainian-made Horizons Lord anti-material rifle, a weapon so unknown it doesn't even have a Wikipedia entry. The round fired was a 57 caliber bullet, meaning the guy it hit likely had a very, very bad day. What's nearly as crazy as the shot itself is the company who produces what is evidently one of the most impressive rifles on earth as a website that looks like it was a year 10 web design project. Returning our focus to the broader war as a whole, unfortunately 2023 did not bring us an end to this conflict that has already stretched on far too long. US intelligence estimates that around 400,000 people have been killed since the start of the war, a war that continues to be as destructive as it is senseless. The end of the news for this month also marks the end of the year. And boy has this year been big. We've transitioned to a human narrator, interviewed people from Ukraine to Gaza, successfully predicted Game of the Year two years on a row, had our videos either struck down or demonetized by FIFA, Joe Rogan, and YouTube itself, and provided eight full hours of news coverage. We've also launched two separate channels, one of which died a quick and horrible death after Swag figured out how expensive it was, and another that actually scored our most watched video of this year. Both will be down below for those wanting a little more Sir Swag in their life. While we're on the subject of what you'd like to see, we're also conducting our yearly survey, which just lets us know what we're doing well, what you'd like to see, and what we can improve upon as a team. The survey itself takes only around two minutes, but it's hugely helpful for how we plan our content schedule over the next year. If you'd like to let your voice be heard in the most concrete way possible, a link to that will be down in the description. We'd also like to once again thank our extremely supportive Patreon supporters. We can count on one hand the number of news episodes we We've actually been able to get monetized over the past five years, and supporters allow us to cover anything we want without restriction. We figure that if you guys are supporting the series, then our only obligations are to you, the viewers, and to make the best videos we possibly can. If you'd like to throw a few bucks our way, a link to support us will be in the description. With all of this out of the way, on behalf of the entire news team, we'd like to wish everyone a happy January of 2024. Black writing is